Good to see everybody here today. Amen. A few are out of town, but uh, we're here. Amen. So we're, we're going to have a very simple lesson. Uh, I mean, we don't need to get too complicated sometimes. And so we're going to have a lesson that's titled, Are You Ashamed of Christ? And so uh, you might make the claim that you are not ashamed of Christ. And I doubt if anyone is in here would, would ever say that, at least publicly. But, let's look at this. Your actions are going to tell the story. And that's what we have to be aware of. Our actions will tell the story. Are we ashamed of Christ or are we not? I mean, so, let, let's, let's look at that for a few minutes. In Mark 8 and verse 38, it says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation... <laughs> The Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of the Father with his holy angels. Fun, isn't it? Yeah, fun. All right. So notice what he says here. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words. All right, so that, that means being ashamed of what Jesus said. Some, a lot of people say, well, I love Jesus, but they really don't appreciate what Jesus had to say. And so they're, they're ashamed of that. And, and that, that's what happens in the sinful generation. And so if that happens, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him. See, the parallel passage of this scripture is Luke 9, verse 26. It says almost the exact same thing. And it's one thing to be ashamed of Jesus the Christ, and, but yet we fail to see the impact of this verse. Because not only what Christ, who Jesus is, but what he stood for and what he taught. That is also included in this idea of being ashamed of Christ. If you reject what he says, if you don't like what he said, if you don't share what he said. I mean, you're, it's just like you're saying, I'm ashamed of these words. And a lot of people will do that. Oh, they'll sit there and say, oh, I love Jesus all day long. And yet, they will not teach the truth. They will not teach people what they need to know as the opportunity arises. And so bring, being ashamed of his words are going to bring the same condemnation as being afraid, ashamed of Jesus himself. And so his words are his teaching and his doctrine. In other words, the gospel. And everything he commissioned, not only the Holy Spirit to speak, which we have in written form, but even his disciples. He said, you go speak these words and the Holy Spirit's going to guide you. And so, all the doctrine of Christ is what is referenced here. And if we're ashamed of that, if we're ashamed of what it says, even if it's just part of what he says, I mean, that, that, that's a problem that we have to deal with. See, this should be a sobering thought to many who wear the name of Christ. Like I said, a lot of people, they claim a real, a, allegiance to Christ, they claim a relationship with Christ, and yet they don't share his, his message. Far too often, for various reasons, we demonstrate that we are ashamed of Christ and his gospel. Sometimes if we're just not living like we're supposed to be living. I mean, this, this in itself is basically telling the, word, the world that... I don't live by what his word says because that's telling them I really don't care what his word says. And, and so we're, we're going to live like the world. And so people do that. And, and so that, that shouldn't be. And, of course, the shame is evidenced by the fact that we do not share the gospel message with others we come in contact with. That, now obviously, we're not going to have an opportunity to sit down and preach a gospel sermon with everybody we meet. But just little things we can say to get them to start focusing upon God would be helpful. And, and so we can do that. And unless you continue to remind others that you're a Christian, they will soon forget. And that, that's true. I mean, if you're in the workplace and you've told your, your co-workers you're a Christian, and if you're not acting like one, then you probably don't want to advertise that. You probably don't want to tell them that you're a Christian. Because they'll, they'll start thinking of you as a hypocrite. Nobody likes to be called a hypocrite. And, and so we do need to remind people that we are Christians. Because otherwise, they'll soon forget. And so, and really, if we're not 
not living faithful and right the way we should be, I can see why you'd be ashamed to tell someone that you're a Christian. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and, and that's what it is. And, and so, if we don't keep reminding people, they're going to forget that. And it could be every time they're around you, they won't uh, consider the words that they're saying. You know, sometimes when when you're trying to live right, and they, they, they're blurt out one of those words, they say usually say, pardon my French, or something like that. And because they know that what they've said is offensive to at least one person in their hearing. And so they will say something like that. But if there's nobody there who's going to be offended by the words they say, they're just going to blurt them out and not even say, pardon my French, or, or whatever uh, form of words they might use. See, the words of Jesus above are hard words for a Christian to swallow because it really gets down to the root of what we're all about. And so we must be aware of that. In essence, Jesus is saying that if we are ashamed of him or his teachings, we will not be able to enter heaven. Some people don't look at it that way. I mean, that's the consequence that we may have to face if we're, if we're too afraid to share the gospel with others, if we're too ashamed of it, and yes, some people are literally ashamed. Some people are just nothing more than cowards who don't want a confrontation or they, they don't want to tell anybody how they need to change their ways. But sometimes we do it because we're ashamed of what it is. I mean, we know that the people that we deal with, they don't want to hear anything about Christ. They don't want to hear about the gospel. They don't want to hear how God has expectations of them. And so... We're just afraid to bring it up. And we just withhold this information that they might need. But how does that demonstrate that Christ has anything to do with us if we don't, as we just sang, own to be like thee? I mean, we, we, we sing, we want to be like Jesus. Jesus had enough compassion to tell people what they needed to hear in order to be saved. And we should also. So this shame is synonymous to denial. I mean, when we withhold it, like we're, we're, we're in effect denying that we believe the words of Jesus are effective or right. And so there is a denial there. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 33, He who denies me, whoever shall deny me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. And so, that, that's what's going to happen if we deny Jesus, if we deny the effectiveness of his words, the effectiveness of his gospel, then we are basically telling the world, we don't think there's anything important here, move on, and just go your way. And we should not be doing that. And we're going to be held accountable for things like that. So clearly the scriptures teach that Christians can lose their salvation by denying by disowning and even being ashamed of Jesus. So if you think about it, you can see the devil at work in this area. And that's what it comes down to, either our fear or we're just letting they, these things affect us so that we're afraid to talk about Jesus. We're afraid to talk about Jesus in this world. It depends maybe who, who we're, we're around. Now, if we're around a bunch of Christian friends, Okay, we're okay to talk about Jesus. Yeah, we, we talk about his salvation, things like that. But when you get around people of the world, it, it's a different story for a lot of people. So, and here's why. Because the devil has failed to get us to live wicked lives or to cause harm to Christ, he chooses a method that is very subtle. And we go along feeling good about ourselves, while at the same time, we become separated from God. How is that possible? Well, because we're not doing what God has asked us to do. And in effect, we are committing sin. Why? James 4, 17. You remember what that says? He that knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. What is the right thing to do? Share the gospel message. See, the time Paul used the word ashamed or shamed uh, several times, and we're going to look at some of those passages and see what he was talking about. And so, in Romans 1, 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
God's power of salvation available to everybody is found where? In the gospel. It's found in the gospel. And neither should we be ashamed of the gospel. We shouldn't be ashamed of it either. And so, yet how often do we promote the gospel to those who need it? Read it. A little reflection here. Probably not as much as we should. And if we're honest with ourselves, we don't. And so, uh, we, we need to reconsider the way we do things and take every opportunity. Yeah, some of us do it. Of course, it's met with resistance. It's met with people who really don't care. They're not going to listen. And they're just going to reject. They might even call you some names. They might even uh, turn on you and uh, uh, treat you very in an ill manner of some sort. But you know what? We know people need the gospel. We should be willing to share it. And our actions speak louder than our words. And, and that's true. Sometimes no words teaches a, 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 a whole lot, right? Silence basically uh, basically gives approval. For, for a lot of people in this world, silence gives approval. That's not the way God sees it, but that's how the world sees it. So if you just remain silent, well, they must be okay with the way I'm living. Doesn't matter what lifestyle I've chosen to live, but if this Christian has no problem with the way I'm living, I mean, it must be okay. So I must be okay. And a lot of people get that impression. See, if you have no shame in the gospel, why are you not sharing it? Just something to consider. Paul also wrote, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us, Romans 5 and verse 5. Now this phrase, hope maketh not a shame. Uh, and, and that's it, the way it is in the King James Version and translated by other words in most other versions of the Bible. And these translations about <coughs> hope. Uh, some says, hope does not disappoint. You know, we have different versions that use that, that language. Hope does not disappoint. Or doesn't make a shame. So we understand that. Hope is not a mockery. I mean, it's something we can hold on to and grab on to. And it's not something that is a mockery. Uh, another version says, hope will never disappoint. I mean, uh, contemporary English version. And uh, uh, because of hope, we are able to hold our heads high no matter what happens. And, and so that, that's how one, one person uh, put it. And that's true because of hope. All right. Hope is not deceptive. It doesn't lie to us. I mean, that, that, that's what, uh, how one person translated those words. And hopefully when we view all of these translations, we will learn the message of the Holy Spirit has given us about hope. And that's why I always encourage people to read three or four different versions. Don't stick your head in one version. You might have a favorite. There's no problem with that. But read other translations, other versions, and you get a better picture of the whole picture. And, and so, uh, we read also, Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of these things is death. Romans 6, 21. Two verses later, says the wages of sin is death. Now, in this context, Paul was discussing their former lifestyle and the things they once did. And we, we can look at ourselves. Before we became a Christian, what was our lifestyle and what was the, would be the result if we didn't change? Yes, eternal death. Now, that, that, that spiritual death that takes place. And, and so, we should be ashamed about what we did. I, I know some of us have mentioned, you know, I did some pretty bad things. I did some things I, I'm not proud of. And we all can say that. There, there's some things. Now, some of us may have grown up goody tissues, but still there's some things that we're embarrassed about that maybe we did, and we, we do that. But before we become a Christian, we'd say, that was the lifestyle I was living. Now I need to change. And hopefully we have changed for the better. And, and so uh, our past should be something that we're ashamed of. So we should be ashamed of those things we've done in the past that hurt God. But we should never be ashamed of what God did for us. Yeah. And that's what Paul spent his whole life. Paul continued on even to the end that, well, I'm the chiefest 
of sinners. I'm the worst one there ever was. And, and obviously we know that's not the case, but that's how he felt. He felt guilt for what he had done to Christians and what he had done to try and cause harm to Christ. And he carried that guilt with him the rest of his life. And, but yet, in the same vein, but yet God has been merciful to me. God has been faithful to me. God has cleansed me of my sins, and God has shown his favor upon me. And so, folks, that's where we need to put our focus. Before we became a Christian, we were a bad dude. I mean, let's just face it. I don't care if he was a goody two-shoes or not. We was a bad dude. And afterwards, after we became a Christian, we become conformed to the image of his son. We, we conform ourselves to the will of God. As we read there in Romans 12 and verse 2. They also, Paul wrote, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. He's writing this to Timothy. Two verse, four verses later, he says, for this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have trusted him until that day. Now, 2 Timothy 1. Verse 8, verse 12. Now, how can it be that here he is, stuck in prison, how can he be not be ashamed about that? That's supposedly supposed to be something that is shameful for people, to be in prison, and to the point that I don't want to ever go through this again. And, and so that's what it would be. But Paul didn't feel that way. I'm not ashamed because why am I in prison in the first place? Because I stood up for God. I stood up for Christ. I stood up for the gospel. I stood up and preached what was the truth. So Paul was not ashamed of that. He, he was in prison, but he wasn't ashamed because of that. He was not ashamed of his Lord and his master, whom he proclaimed even while he was in prison. So he knows who he believed in, and he's convinced that this one is able to guard him and protect him and entrust him out until that day that he meets him face to face. We should never be ashamed to share the gospel story and the grace of God. Sometimes all it takes is, look what it did for me. I mean, for some of us, we can say that. Look what it did for me. Look how my life changed. Look, look how it changed for the better. And if we started living as Christians are supposed to live, our life changed for the better. No question about that. Now, Philippians 1, Paul wrote, According to my earnest expectation and hope that I shall not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ shall even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. You know, Philippians 1 and verse 20. You know, back in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27, he says, I buffet my body daily. In other words, I keep it under subjection so that the adversaries that I might have do not have anything to accuse me of. Because let's face it, Paul started preaching this gospel and his adversaries were watching him. Just like they're watching you. Your adversaries against God and Jesus are watching you hoping for you to make a mistake. And then they can, that's their little aha moment. Aha, you're not like you said you're supposed to be. You do these things. And, and so he says, I'm not going to be put shame in anything because I have learned to control myself and be careful what I say <coughs> and what I speak. And so that, that's, that's where he was. And so... He, he's going to always exalt Christ in his body, in his life, or even if it takes him to his death. He's not going to be ashamed of Christ at all. And that's how he lived. So if we have hope in the promise of God and we share his gospel message, we have no reason to be ashamed. And for we are trying to exalt Christ in all that we are and everything that we do. I mean, what is the difference between that and the way Paul was? There is no difference. Paul said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. And so, if Paul was willing to endure this stuff, and he endured a lot, 
Go to Second Corinth, Second Corinthians, chapter twelve, and and read all the things that happened to Paul in the shipwrecks, being beat up, being left for dead, being stoned, uh, being tortured, all sorts of things. And yet he did it gladly. Why? Because he knew that salvation was through the gospel, and he was willing to present that gospel. And he continued doing it as long as he could. So when our our actions when our actions indicate something different, there's need to be concerned. And sometimes that happens. Sometimes our actions do not match up with what we say. We say we love Jesus, but then our actions say otherwise. We we love going to church, but our actions say otherwise. I mean, if we don't go to uh, all the services of the church, if we don't go to the classes. I mean, what are they there for? To learn about God. Learn what God wants us to do. And, and so, there may be concern when we start acting like that. See, here's a quote from an article I read quite a few years ago now. But anyway, it says, Dear reader, if you are ashamed of the Lord Jesus and his words among the wicked in your neighborhood, your job site, your family, your friends, etc., he in turn will be ashamed of you. That is fact, even though you might go to church, as people say in our day, and live a moral life. That's true. You might go to church. You might live that life, well, I don't drink, I don't cuss, and, and I try and be nice to people. But folks, if you don't share God's message, what good are you? I mean, honestly, look, answer that question. What good am I if I don't try and help people get to heaven? So do your best. You, you'll, you'll meet this rejection. There's no doubt about that. You probably have experienced that. That's why you don't do it anymore. You'll be met with rejection. You'll, you'll be met with mockery and all sorts of things. You, you'll be met with resistance. And, of course, Satan's going to be the agent that's providing this resistance. But you're going to be met with that stuff. But unless you're sharing the message, it's not going to do you any good. See, part of our good fight is to battle against being ashamed of Jesus and his gospel among the wicked, the lost, the deceivers, and all those in error. That is our good fight. You know, Paul said there in 2 Timothy 4, fight the good fight of faith. He says, I fought the fight, I've kept the faith. And so we need to be like that. We need to fight the good fight. And the biggest battle is not with the denominations, not with the atheists, not with the, the Muslims or anything like that. The biggest battle we have is right here. It's in our own minds. It's in our own hearts. That's where the biggest battle lies, the most important battle we have to deal with. Galatians 5 talks about the, the in-between, enmity between the flesh and the spirit. There's a battle taking place, and it's there. And even though we may suffer persecution or fear that we might suffer persecution, let us not forget that the battle hardest to fight is the one within ourselves. And so we must recognize that. Notice in Galatians 6, 6 through 9, And let the one who has taught the word share all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we shall reap if we do not grow <clears throat> weary. Now, when we start thinking, what does it mean to sow to your own flesh? Practically everybody starts thinking, okay, get involved in fornication, cursing, uh, drunkenness, things like that. That's what we start thinking about the flesh. But when we start thinking, well, I may be safer if I don't say anything about Christ. That is no different than sowing to the flesh. And that's what it is. But if we sow to the Spirit... What does the Spirit want me to do? 
All we have to do is pick up our Bible. This is what the Spirit wants us to do. Live this way and teach this way. Do what we can for these people. See, we have a day coming whereby we will give an account of our actions and the books of God will judge us. We know that's coming. It could be maybe if we die a natural death or it could be when the Lord returns. But we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We have that in many passages in the scriptures. We're all going to be judged based upon what God has said. And he, he has given us and told us what he expects of us. A lot of times, we just kind of set our own expectations, our, our own bar, and try, as long as we reach our own bar, we seem to be okay with that. But folks, the bar we should be reaching is Christ. That's the bar that God established for us that we should be trying to acquire. A couple of weeks ago, we had that lesson, I'm not perfect, but I'm trying. Yeah, perfection is our goal. That's where we need to be. And, and so, that's what we need to do. See, God has given each of us the duty to share the gospel message with those who need it. Do you know anybody who needs the gospel? I think every one of us can say, yes. Everybody knows that. So failing to share that message conveys the same idea that basically we're ashamed to mention the gospel to anybody. We don't want to bring it up. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Well, folks, if they're in sin, what's, what, what's going to happen if they stand before God before someone teaches them? They're going to get their feelings hurt. He said, depart from me. You that practice iniquity. Yeah. So what God wants us to do is help people avoid that condemnation. And all of this, if we're ashamed to mention the gospel, will be the same as being ashamed of God and Christ. So, I mean, it's a simple lesson to understand, and it is a sin to be ashamed of Christ. So we've got to do some self-reflection sometimes. And we're, am I doing enough? That, that's the question we, we can all ask ourselves. And hopefully we'll be honest and say, I'm not doing enough. I need to do more. And you might look at some people who do a lot and think, well, I mean, they're guaranteed. No, they're not guaranteed that spot. But as long as we're trying to do more and to be better, then we have that opportunity to be right with God. So think about those things. Uh, we always offer the invitation. If anyone needs to respond, we'd like to come while we stand and sing. <laughs>